Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for having us tonight. I could uh, listen to Abdul Qadi, uh, Qadir's uh, stories all night, and I can listen to his French accent all night as well. So he's a humble guy, he's a very sweet uncle, and uh, his uh, passion for the cause is felt, I'm sure, by us all, and how an important subject this is, um, and how we have to constantly raise awareness of this issue. It constantly surfaces in our consciousness, but then it peppers away. And so we need these reminders constantly to remind ourselves also that this is not, as many people might think, a political issue necessarily. This is a humanitarian issue. And so regardless of people's persuasions, that this is, uh, this is incredibly important that everyone's hearts be with the Palestinian people. And we're seeing even um, you know, many, many celebrities, be they non-Muslims, personalities in the media, that are aware of the uh, dire situation in Palestine and making stances, sometimes when we don't even see those stances coming from the Muslim community. And so it's very, very rewarding to see that and encouraging to see that from the, the wider community. And we have to support, support them as well. I think of just not just uh, raising money, this is very important, we need to do this. But there's many things we can do. And of those things, we can raise awareness through, now we have so many means, through the social media, we can achieve things that was impossible before. And so for people to raise awareness amongst their, their networks and their communities about what's going on there, so people realize that this is a humanitarian issue, and it's not a political issue as many people will try to make out, so they try to dismiss the needs of the Palestinian people. Also things we can do, practical things, is to, uh, is, is to actually, those personalities and people in the wider community that are spreading awareness, that we support them as well, and we congratulate them for their um, courage to come out and speak out about these, these issues. And fourthly, one of the most important things obviously, is to remind ourselves that this is a religious obligation for us, as speaking from a, a Muslim perspective, and that this cause is something that's very dear to the, pro to the heart of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we see this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah God Almighty, He's mentioned in the Quran specifically this area of land, and that it's sacred to us as Muslims. As He said, as the, the young reciter of Quran recited tonight, Subhanallahi asra bi abadihi layla min al masjid al harami il al masjid al aqsa ladi barakna hawla li nuriyahu min ayatina inna huhu al sami' al alim. Allah God Almighty said, Glory, hallowed be he who took his slave by night from the sacred sanctuary, referring to Mecca, to the furthest place of worship, of prostration, i.e. the Temple Mount, Masjid al-Aqsa, that we bless around it. It's very interesting because God's saying here in these verses, not only is it blessed, but in fact it's blessed around it. So if, if the parameters of this area are blessed, then what do you think about the very centre, the core of this? And so, and thus people who live in this area, they are blessed as well. And so he says, we bless around it, why? In order for us to show him, God says, in all our power, might and glory, in order to show him, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, from our signs, verily he, i.e. God, is all hearing and all knowing. And so God blessed this land by mentioning it in his holy book. And what's very interesting is that this place was even blessed uh, before Islam in that God chose for one of the grandfathers of the Prophet, peace, uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace and blessings be upon him, to die here and be buried here. Who? Hashim. The Prophet وسلم, he's known as the Nabil Hashimi. Hashim, there's actually a mosque right in Gaza, that they, uh, they reckon that his grandfather, because his grandfathers were travelers, tradesmen that used to trade, and even his father, Abdullah, he was actually fell sick in Gaza, and when he, he actually passed away coming back from Gaza, and he, passed, and he passed away just outside of Medina, known as Yathrib at the time. And his grandfather, Hashim, actually they have a mosque marking where he's actually buried in Gaza. So even before Islam, one of the grandfather, great grandfathers of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is buried there. And we know when the Prophet Muhammad was born, 
He relates that when I was born, a light shone from my mother that lit up the palaces of the Levant, Sham. And Sham is not Syria. Sham is this whole area. And so we know that God's light shines on this place and it's blessed. And that we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that even before he let, when he was residing in Mecca and he was preaching his message, that he actually, despite he was actually facing the Kaaba, he was ordered to face towards Jerusalem. And so he would put his, basically, he would face the Kaaba northward so that he was facing both. And that we know that that was the, the direction of prayer for us. And so, and the Prophet Sallallahu obviously his heart was directed towards it. And so this place is incredibly significant and incredibly special for us. And so it's, it's, very, it's imperative that we have concern about the place and we have concern about them. And one of the other things that's very important, and alhamdulillah, I'm, um, I, inshallah, my intention is to actually go there this Ramadan to actually visit it. Um, so this is going to be the first time that I actually go. And I think that's very important for us because there's nothing like seeing you know, seeing is believing. And so just as Abdul Qadir, you go there, you can't help when you go back to be affected by these things and you have more passion to do something about it. And so that's one thing I remember someone saying, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not quoting him by word, but I, what was the best of my knowledge, he was saying that what should we, someone asked the Palestinians, what should we do for you? He says one thing is to raise awareness and one of those ways of raising awareness is actually to come. They want more Muslims to actually come and visit the land so people can actually see what's going on there. And thus, when we go back, we have more compassion and more concern about these people. So these, these things are very, very important. And obviously, the focus tonight is actually supporting them financially. And I was asking Qasim, actually, at the beginning of, I said, how do you get anything in there? Because I was doing my little bit of research that I have to do for every talk. And basically, nothing can get into Palestine. And he says, no, we have people on the ground in there. Who, and we, we were there before the last crisis, and we're able to still get it there, the money. We can't get food because the food goes to waste. Basically, what happens is the Israelis leave it to rot, and then they take it in. And so we actually get money in there. 100% of our uh, donations get in there so that people can actually buy what they need. And so you can feel, uh, with, you can have uh, certainty this money that you're giving tonight is going. And this giving money supporting people financially was one of the first acts in Islam. After the prayer, very interesting, is that what was the major situation in Mecca? Mecca was a, you know, a very difficult situation for the early Muslims. They were struggling and they were persecuted and they were basically told to have patience and turn to God and make prayer. Again, another important thing that we need to do for the people. And, but not just prayer. What was interesting was one of the most profound and one of the most passionate, uh, um, one of the most passionate people that stood for and supported the other Muslims in this time of suffering was Abu Bakr radiAllahu an. May God be pleased with him. And what was he doing? He was going around finding all the Muslims who were persecuted amongst the slaves, and he was giving all his wealth out in order to actually free them. And his father, who was not Muslim, he said, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? You know, wa wasting your money. You're not even just, the money you're spending, you're buying slaves that are useless to you. You're buying slaves that are women and weak, the weak. They're not going to be able to do anything for you. Remember, slavery was something very prevalent in their society. And generally, people would buy a slave that was strong so they could help them and support them in their daily activities. And, uh, activities. and he says, Father, I'm not buying these people to defend me. He says, I, my intention is something very, very different. And so this is what we're really doing. When we're giving finance, we're trying to liberate and help people from their plight, from their circumstances. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed a verse about him. Abu Bakr, in Surah Al-Layl, wa si yujannabu hal atqa alladhi yukti ma'lahu yatazakka. And he will, have, he will be uh, moved away from it. He will be removed from it, what the fire, the hellfire, who? He who gives his wealth with the intention, what? To purify himself. And zakah is a very interesting word in Arabic. The two words we have for charity in Arabic, he says in the Quran, yetazakah, for him to purify himself. He's giving his wealth 
in order to purify himself. But the word zakah does not just mean purity. The word zakah means growth. Because the reality of charity is, if you look at the tenets of faith in Islam, we have the shahada, where you testify that there is no God, God, no deity worthy of worship, except for God Almighty himself. You're declaring this, that I live my life for God. I live my life for a higher conscious being that's beyond the confounds of my consciousness. And thus, I utter that, I declare that openly. Then you have the prayer. And the prayer is a physical expression of that submission to a higher conscious being. So then our third tenet of faith is zakat, is giving the alms tax to the needy. And that, what are you doing when you give that? You're increasing and growing your consciousness about other people's needs. And so the first tenets are about consciousness of the almighty consciousness and awareness and being. Whilst the zakat, once you become aware that there's an almighty consciousness that we need to uh, attach ourselves to, that we need to reach out to beyond our own consciousness and selfish needs, also because of that understanding of that, there's other consciousnesses around you, people that you need to reach out to. And that's one of the blessings of charity, it's an expression that you are conscious of other people's needs. And it's an expression as well that you are going beyond your means, your own, your own selfish needs, your own primary needs to give to others. And that's the other, and so thus the other word for charity in Arabic is sadaqa. And sadaqa comes from a root that means to be genuine. Because when you give, it's, it's easy to, you know, for many people, it's easy to pray. Because it could be done for selfish reasons. But it's very generally difficult to give wealth especially when it's a vast amount of wealth that you need, someone really needs, is that you basically, it's an expression of your true, genuine belief. Because you're not, you say, I might not get this wealth back, and I might need this wealth, but I'm gonna give it because I know that, there is, that there's greater need, and I know there's gonna be a greater return. And that's what's so beautiful, is when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, went on the night journey. So he traveled from Mecca on this, this spiritual journey, this uh, honestly unbelievable journey where he traveled physically from Mecca to Medina, uh, sorry, Mecca to Jerusalem, and then he ascends. And when he ascends and he goes past all the different prophets visit, visiting them, guess what he comes to? When he comes to the doors of paradise, what does he find there? The Prophet says in a sound hadith related by Siyuti in Jamir al Kabir, Sahir, sorry, he says, I saw on the night that I was ascended into the heavens. I was, sorry, the night, the night that I was taken, I saw in the gate of, of the garden, paradise, inscribed a sadaqa bi ashri amthariha. When you give charity, you get ten in back in reward. This is written on the gates of paradise. So there's, in, there's huge significance in this. But then he says, وَالْقَرْدُ بِثَمَانِتِ عَشَرِ So then he says, giving a loan is 18. <coughs> and the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, perplexed. How is it that a, a loan is more virtuous than charity? He says, he says, when someone comes to you and asks, it's not necessarily that he needs it. You're not, you might, you know, this person's coming to you, there you are in a shopping centre, this guy comes up to you and says, I need some money, I've got to get back to my country, and so forth, he gives you a story. You don't know if he's genuine. He says, but if someone comes to you asking for a loan, you know they're desperate. And you know these people have integrity because they're saying, I don't want to ask for charity. I want to have that I am desperate. I have no, you know, I have no means to support myself, but I am determined to support myself. So I'm going to take a loan from you and I intend to pay you back. Now that's integrity. And so the whole point is that a loan is more virtuous than a uh, charity because you don't know the intention of the person. But we know the intention of these people. <laughs> That's the reality. And so these words are actually, so the reward for giving to people when you are certain they are needy is far greater than any normal charity. And so when we actually know these people and we know their suffering, it's so, the reward is, you know, is, is uh, unfathomable. And these are, these are words inscribed on the gates of paradise. And then another concept from a different perspective is that the Prophet 
He says, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادُّهِمْ فِي تَوَادِّهِمْ وَتَرَاحُمِهِمْ وَتَعَاطِفِهِمْ مَثَلُ الْجَسَدِ He says, the likeness of the believers in their compassion for one another, their love for one another, and their compassion for one another, and their affection for one another, is like what? It's like a body. If one limb, if you get a sore finger, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is giving an analogy of the community. Is that when one part of the community suffers, what happens to the rest of the body? He says the rest of the body goes down in fever. Now, this is very profound because what happens is, is when, when people suffering happens in a certain location, there's a locus of suffering, what happens? If you can imagine it, it hits and it has a ripple effect. Now, historically, the people around will be aware of this and it becomes, basically, it becomes like second-hand trauma. Today, we talk about many different forms of trauma. And one of the worst kinds of trauma, actually, for some people, in some circumstances, is second-hand trauma. A man called David Baselli, who has a trauma technique called trauma release exercises, he talks about uh, relief work he was doing in Eritrea, if, that, if my pronunciation of that country is correct. And he said, what's really interesting, he says there was a lot of refugees from, uh, that came from Eritrea, and they, they actually settled in Ethiopia to escape the persecution that was happening there in Eritrea. And he said the families that were actually... Um, settled in Ethiopia, they had no source of knowledge about what was actually happening um, to their people. They were being persecuted and killed in Eritrea. And it caused so much trauma for them because they were imagining the absolute worst situation. First and foremost, they couldn't, they didn't know what was going on. So their imagination just imagined something even worse than probably the reality of the situation. The second one was they could do nothing about it. And are in now in the recent development of trauma, trauma, second-hand trauma, sometimes is worse than first-hand trauma because when you don't know what to do about a situation, despair, that's when trauma sets in. And so these families, basically, were really like in despair, fear, anxiety, all sorts of experiences, and they were in really bad shape. When they actually got reunited with their families in Arithia, they found the people that went through the trauma was actually in a better state than the people that never experienced the trauma. He says, why was this? Because the person in the trauma, the person, sorry, the person being persecuted, they were able to run from their homes and escape and experience the, uh, the jubilation of safety after fear. They were actually to be in a, they were able to complete that process. He says, whilst the families and the others, they, could, they were just sitting there in despair, not knowing what to do when they didn't speak. Because when, a, when a, tri a tribulation, when some sort of horrific situation comes to a crisis, there's a physical need, there's a need physically to make a reaction to it. And that's why in September the 11th, they found there was far less trauma in September the 11th than there was in Hurricane Katrina, because they kept people basically pinned down in tents so they couldn't run back to their homes and do anything about it. And so we have to realize, on a subconscious level, when we hear, and now, because of social media, we see these things, it's basically our bodies are screaming for us to react to these. And when we sit passively and do nothing about these things, it's very dangerous. Because trauma, uh, a, 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 a crisis, demands a reaction. And so the very least we can do is pray for the people. That's so important. You have to understand physiologically and psychologically and spiritually, you have to react to the situation. And now the problem with television is that you see it, especially now social media, you have a Facebook and you're scrolling down, you see a horrific picture of some sort of event, and then you've got your mate's picture of him on the face. <laughs> and it's like, it anesthetizes you from the reality, and that's very dangerous because the energy still stays in the body. And so it's imperative that we do something. And now, look, People didn't do anything about the Syrian refugees. God's basically sending them on our doorstep to do something about it. And we basically, they're in our communities now. And even now, some people are like, we don't want them here and, you know, causing a nuisance. We need to help these people because it's affecting us as well. 
So we have to, and if people actually stop thinking it's somewhere else, then these things wouldn't have this ripple effect and actually spread. And so the people in Gaza, we really need to be there for them for our own sakes. As the Prophet said, the body goes down in fever. You are, and now we're, we're a global community. It's not like it was before. We all know what's going on. We have no excuse. And we have to act for their sake and for our sake. So I ask you all tonight to give generously and to bless and accept all the charity and the prayers that we make to them tonight. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.